Hello, Duke fans, and welcome to episode 486 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. It is Sunday morning, February 5th, 2023. Everyone is a little tired and hopefully a little bit more sober than they were last night when Duke beat North Carolina. It was the first uh, victory for John Shire against the Tar Heels in his coaching career. The final score, 63-57. to I know we did a quick reaction last night with Donald uh, live from I don't know I, I suppose it was the the space between Cameron Indoor Stadium and and the uh, the main quad on Duke University's West Campus. Now we're all at least seated again. Uh, Donald appears to be wherever he is in Durham before headed back to Washington D.C. this morning. I am your host. I am Sam Klein. Uh, I'm joined, of course, by Donald and by Jason Evans, as I always am. So, Donald, how are you feeling this morning, first of all? Uh, well, like many of you, I did not go to bed until very, very late last night. We actually didn't really party that much afterwards. We uh, we had my godson, as I mentioned, with the game, and, and he needed to get home. We stopped by and saw a friend and kind of casually hung out for a bit and then went back so he could get to bed. Um, but, yeah, it was just kind of as you do. You kind of go to Sports Center and – look at all the plays and relive kind of, you know, all the great moments over and over again. That was me for about, you know, three hours after the game last night, which was phenomenal. All the plays being all of the blocks that Derek Lively administered. They didn't uh, do uh, all upon eight. North Carolina. They didn't do all eight, but they did most of them. That's for sure. Jason Evans is also here this morning. How are you today, sir? I'm doing fine and dandy, although I didn't sleep very well because I always get so hyped up by a Duke Carolina game that I just, my adrenaline won't let me go to sleep. It really is a different feeling. And and I, I know I'd mentioned this last night, but this felt like like a classic tournament game almost as much as it felt like a classic Duke UNC game. Uh, you know, the, so much tension, so much back and forth. At the end of the game, there was, you know, the, the, the scoring really slowed. I mean, the scoring was slow all night, but the scoring really slowed down near the end of the game, which just ratcheted up the the tension uh so we need to talk about it in depth i know that we hit on a few of these topics yesterday when we recorded but we're going to rehash them now it's so fun to to get to talk about a carolina win twice so we're going to do that right here i know i also uh, threw out some headlines last night when we started so i'm I'm sticking with mine which was cameron comes a lively uh, i know we got a few other uh, headlines along those lines before i get to the listener ones Jason, did you have a headline from last night? I did. And and by the way, the number of listener headlines is just unreal. I love it. It's so much great stuff. My headline is this. A different Duke dominates crunch time against UNC. As we discuss this game, I will explain to you why the team we saw last night is, is fundamentally different from the Duke team that we have observed for the past three months. Donald, what'd you have? So mine is... Roach and Lively let UNC know they got a story to tell. And if if you know, you know. Oh, I like it. I, I I dove into the listener headlines. I know I shared a few last night that that were fun and sort of related to the one that I had shared. We got multiple. Uh, Cameron comes alive. Duke comes alive. So so clearly I wasn't that uh, creative last night when I was coming up with that one. Uh, Mitchell Tier sent us Duke gets lively in the paint and blocks out UNC. I enjoyed that one. Uh, and and Daniel Griffith's version of this was this time Duke is a very lively in their defense of Cameron Indoor Stadium. So uh, I think that the 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 theme speaks for itself. So there was a couple that I enjoyed. One uh, from Ron Pereira, who kind of was in that same lively theme. He, he goes, Duke throws lively block party. Heels not invited, which speaks to what lively did in the paint last night. And then finally, there was a lot. Sam, we got a lot that had the lively puns in there but there are some that were just very simple and they just said go to hell carolina go to hell i love yeah we got about we got about half a dozen of those which <laughs> yeah which is always good uh and 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 we enjoy that all right by, so by the way by the way we had i counted we had close to 30 headlines that people sent us so i'm sorry if we didn't read yours but there were a lot <laughs> no here's um, the thing we read them all if we couldn't get them on the show right that's what right. we apologize for but we read them all they were all fantastic keep them coming i also appreciate the 
completely dry humor of Chris Bynum's submission, our Northwestern transfer is better than your Northwestern transfer <laughs> on a night. He was. <laughs> on a so. night when Ryan Young, I think, uh, played five minutes. And his biggest highlight was that in the uh, pregame slideshow that the that the team shared, all the guys were wearing like T-shirts that had, you know, cool logos around their names. And Ryan Young was wearing like a cable knit sweater. <laughs> I don't know if, if you if you see it on the it's a post on the on like the Duke men's basketball Instagram yeah. and everyone's like, oh, you know, the Derek Lively shirt. So fire. Oh, the the Jeremy Roach shirt. So fire. Oh, Ryan Young looking really sharp. <laughs> doesn't yeah. doesn't need any of that. He looked like so, a grandpa. I think that's I think that's better than trip. I think that performance. Frank, I mean, Chris Bynum listener is right because it's better than Pete Nance going over five from three. You know, you'd rather you'd rather you'd rather be Ryan Young backing up Derek Lively last night than you would be Pete Nance in the starting lineup. Oh yeah, yeah. By the way, and speaking of you know interaction with listeners and stuff like that, uh, a friend of mine. This wasn't directly related to the podcast, but just because we are talking about sort of what we heard from others. Uh, a friend of mine, Michael Rosenberg, wrote a line uh, to a little email group of Duke friends where we talk about games, and he said, "Wouldn't it be nice if we just just saw Lively's Zubek game?" We've talked repeatedly about that moment that the light came on for Zubek that led to Duke winning a national title. I mean, I don't know. I don't know that the results are going to be the same, but the Derek Lively we had last night felt like a different guy than the Derek Lively that we've seen the rest of this season. I haven't been watching Duke basketball, you know, as closely as as Jason has for as long as Jason has. I don't remember anybody putting on a, a block show like this in a Duke uniform. Jason, I, I, I like there, there's nobody like this. Yeah, but just in terms, of, I think the idea was in terms of a big man who hasn't necessarily produced a ton suddenly coming alive and uh, and, and turning into an, a, a huge force in the paint the way Zubek did in the 2010, you know, down the stretch for that national title team. So why don't we start the good there? Because Derek Lively is is clearly the story for Duke, even if there were other guys on the floor that made huge contributions. I'm sure we want to talk about Jeremy Roach. I'm sure we want to talk about Tyrese Proctor and Kyle Filipowski, guys who had, you know, ha- had great games. But Derek Lively is clearly the, the story of this one. The headlines tell us that. Uh, all the write-ups tell us that. And of course, uh, the, the, the stats tell us that. 14 rebounds, eight blocks, only four points. Uh, which I think are, you know, they're both put back dunks, but uh, could you have more impact on the game only scoring four points? Donald, let me start with you. What did you see from Lively in the building? And, and was there a particular Lively block that that had you uh, uh, extra stank face? Yes. Um, one of his one of his blocks, or I should say a couple of his blocks uh, were my favorite play of the game. Um, we'll talk about the favorite plays later. So I'll hold withhold what which one that was. But I think the thing that I loved the most was how he quote and I say this in air quotes because Armando Baycott still got some of his points he had 12 in the first half but he ended up with 14 in the game which means he had a terrible second half guys here's a stat for you and this is something that speaks to how bad lively owned Armando Baycott in the second half Baycott's final field goal attempt came at the 12 17 mark with 12 17 left in the game he took his final shot of the game for a guy who is an All-American, who was UNC's best player, one of the ACC's all-time great rebounders and double-double machines, that man did not touch the ball in the final 12 minutes of this rivalry. So that tells you how bad uh, Derek Lively was just just destroying him on defense. And also, when he was able to do that, knowing that it, he still had Armando Baycott that he had to worry about, the fact that he was able to have that help defense and really just close down the paint with his blocks for other guys who were driving the lane, I thought was especially spectacular. That's something we haven't seen from Derek Lively before. And I'm, I'm sure that the level of the opponent, the quality of who he was matching up against in Armando Baycott, that challenge, he rose to that, to that, you know, opportunity and he met it at the rim several, several times during the game. So uh, I really, I really loved what I saw from him, not just the blocks, but really just how he locked down, Armando Baycott in the second half and still was able to lock down others who dared enter the paint. So uh, like Sam said, that four, eight, 14 stat line is one of the most ridiculous things you, that you will ever see. Uh, I, I mentioned last night to you guys, it's, it's Dennis Rodman esque. And, and that's not to, that's not to, you know, 
there, there are a lot of people who criticize Dennis Rodman. Dennis Rodman was a game changer and and uh, someone who won multiple multiple rings in the NBA because he could absolutely impact the entire game by what he was doing on half of the floor. And that's what Derek Lively was doing last night. And it, by the way, it was more than just the block shots. His ability to switch, to hedge and recover was absolutely huge in this game. North Carolina uses Armando Baycott as a screener. Almost all, like that's like the way half their possessions start. He comes out and screens and they hope that one of three things are going to happen. That either R.J. Davis or Caleb Love will get an angle to the basket. That Baycott will roll to the basket and get in good position or get a layup or something like that. Or that there'll be a switch and that Davis and Love will get a big man on them that they can exploit. And that's that's 90% of the Carolina offense. And it's super, super effective with three guys who have done it for three years now and know how to make that work. It it didn't work at all. <laughs> it didn't work at all against Duke. And that's because Derek Lively and Jeremy Roach and Tyrese Proctor did such an amazing job of communicating and uh, and working hard on those screens. Lively would hedge and switch beautifully. The communication was just out of this world. And and by the way, in the post game, there was an amazing moment where Jeremy Roach was asked about you know the the drive he had at the end of the game, where they gave Duke a four point lead um, uh, with about twenty seconds left, where um, R.J. Davis is driving is guarding him, and and he uses Kyle Filipowski to drag Pete Nance away and give Jeremy Roach gets an easy lane to the basket. And Roach said, and I'm talking about the communication here, he said that he knew that play was going to work because. Carolina hadn't been talking or communicating all game. And it's the kind of play where the, the defenders have to talk to each other so they know where they are. And that R.J. Davis didn't know where Pete Nance was because they weren't talking. And as a result, it was an easy lane to the basket. I only bring it up to talk about how well Duke was communicating and getting back to Lively. In addition to those eight blocks, the shots that he altered. I mean, I saw Armando Baycott hesitating, looking over his shoulder, just playing afraid a lot of the time. I mean, Baycott was just six of 12 on two point field goals. He He's usually way, way better than that. And like you said, Donald, I mean, zero points, zero touches in the final 12 minutes. It was about as close to a perfect defensive game as I think I've seen from a Duke big man ever. And, and for him to play 34 minutes, Derek Lively and only pick up two fouls while guarding Armando Baycott, who is, as good as anyone in the country at drawing fouls. Like I said, it's close to a perfect game by a defensive center. And and it wasn't just Lively that was doing that. Like Duke committed so few fouls on the night, especially when you, you know, strip out the ones that they were able to use down the stretch because they had fouled so few times. I mean, the the whole Duke team was was uh, avoiding the wrong kind of contact with UNC and whether that was Baycott uh, or or Pete Nance, just none of that was happening for for Carolina, as you said, Jason. It wasn't just that the wasn't just that those those high screens weren't working. Carolina's physicality wasn't overwhelming Duke either. And and I was commenting to my friend who I was watching the game with that, you know, the the tough thing about this game is that Baycott is bigger than all the Duke guys. Like Duke has size, Baycott has a different kind of size, and he wasn't pushing Duke around at all last night because lively was in all of the right positions i think also you know throw flip into that equation on defense i mean i think the uh, i think flip only had one block but the one block he did have um that wasn't co i guess you know you have a co sack uh half sack whatever in, in the nfl he had a couple co blocks with Derek lively but there was one early in the first half where rj davis took a three and flip blocked it it was just you know just enough of a of a, of a tip of the fingertips where it altered the shot. And after that, they had to realize that, yo, these big men aren't playing around with this, with the screen that we're going to do, they're going to be ready for this. And Duke was ready for every single one guys real quickly. Uh, that game last night was the third lowest combined score in a Duke UNC game ever. If you look at the 10 lowest combined scores, Duke has won every one of those games. So for us, we actually like it when it's a low scoring affair, because it means that our defense is on point and UNC really doesn't have anything to match it. Yo, know, two things related to what you guys were just saying. First of all, it was the 57 points was Carolina's lowest point total of the season this year. This is Duke. Duke has now held nine teams 
nine different teams to their lowest point total of the season. That's that's truly remarkable defense. And I, I heard a great stat. This was UNC's lowest number of points, fewest points that they've scored in Durham since 2010, which was John Shire's senior night. I thought I, like, 50. I, I love that. I love that. That was it. That was a fun game. I, I, I recall that one. And, and and the other thing I want to mention, you guys are talking about the, the free throws. Sam, you were talking about the free throws earlier. Did you guys see the postgame news conference from Hubert Davis? Oh, oh, Hubert, basically, someone would ask a question. You could ask Hubert, what? how was the weather today? And his answer was, did you know we only shot three free throws, even though we're the leading free throw shooting team in the ACC? Hubert had was a one-trick pony. He could not stop talking. Like, he wanted to criticize the refs so badly. He was so furious about the the number of free throws Carolina didn't take that every question, no matter what you said to him, his answer was, we only shot three free throws, zero in the second half, even though we're the leading free throw shooting team in the ACC. Wow. Wow. Boo boo. I'm so but sorry. He had Roger Hubert. Ayers there. Roger Ayers made his appearance and he, and he, he made his calls uh, that got Cameron riled up uh, at points during the game. But I feel like Duke just kind of matched that and said, okay, well, if you're going to make these calls, we're going to go ahead and, and drive through. And and they were, I think, guys just all around, the, all across the board were smart at keeping, you know, UNC in front of them. And UNC had, if you think about it, UNC had a few wide open shots that they just missed. And oh, it wasn't like there was a lot of, weren't a lot of calls either way. You know, we hit the bonus late in the first half. I think we hit the bonus late in the second half as well. But it wasn't like we had 15,000. We were shooting you know, one and ones from the 10 minute mark, like sometimes we, we have to experience the other team doing it. It was a, it was just a battle. And I think at a certain point, the, the referees just said, Hey, these guys are playing hard, but they're playing clean. Let's let them play. I, I, I went back and watched all of Derek Lively's block shots. There's, there wasn't a single one of them where I'm like, Oh, that probably could have been called a foul. No way. He, he was using his length and it, it wasn't like, you were going, wow, they're just letting them get away with anything in this game. There are a couple moments where it was physical inside, like you said, Donald. But I, I think Carolina only shot three free throws because they were mostly taking three-pointers. They were refusing to go in the lane because they were terrified of going up against Mount Lively. And and those three-pointers, I know we don't have to reiterate too much, but the three-pointers were not falling for Carolina outside of, of Leaky Black in the second half last night. I mean, you know, we, we got... I think we got ourselves riled up about Love and Davis just coming back in. Love has, has tortured Duke in in previous appearances, and I think he made one of his early threes uh, from from about thirty five feet. And I thought, you know, if he's taken those shots all night, there's something tells me that that the the luck doesn't stick around for him, and he's only two for seven. So you, you take that every time, guys. I want to uh, change topics a little bit here and talk continuing in the good about the collective play of Jeremy Roach and Tyrese Proctor, who I know we've talked all season about how I think Coach Shire and and those two guys have had a hard time sort of sorting out whose role is what. Um, who's the primary ball handler? What are they supposed to be doing both on defense and on offense as they sort of share backcourt responsibilities? Uh, Roach, of course, was the was the point guard, the, the you know, the, the slotted in point guard coming into the season. Proctor was talking a lot about his own point guard development. I think we saw their best collective game last night. Roach is seven for 18 from the field or from, from two point land, but has some of the most incredible drives. Jason highlighted, I think the most important one that happened right at the end of the game. Uh, Proctor was leading the break a few times. He got uh, a few very impressive steals and both of them pulled down seven rebounds last night. Uh, Proctor goes for five assists and, and three turnovers. I mean, Yo, 10, five complete- and five game. Proctor had the, our, I think, our first 10 5 and 5 game. Yeah, Proc- that's right. Oh, good point. Proctor yeah. has the first 10 5 5 game, goes for 11 points, um, uh, you know, on, on 13 shots. So he's still not the most efficient scorer. But how much more, you know, we talked, Jason, you said that this was Derek Lively having the light come on. Does it feel like Tyrese Proctor has also had the light come on, especially when it comes to playing alongside Jeremy Roach? Yeah, it, it, it really does. And, you know, I, I I teased in my headline that I feel like we see we're seeing a different Duke, a new Duke. Uh, the running and fast breaking was something that we just haven't seen from Duke that much this year. Tyrese Proctor's pass to Kyle Filipowski with about 14 and a half minutes left in the second half 
where where Flip was, you know, there was I think it was a there was a long rebound or something like that, and Proctor had the ball in his hands and he looks up, and really it's not like Flip was well ahead of the field. He was basically even with the Carolina defenders, but Proctor, you know, doing what a point guard does, recognized, oh, you know, if I toss this up there, Flip will get to it first, and and you know he'll be in a situation where he can make that bucket. We haven't seen that from Duke this year. It's just the kind of somewhat risky, but also you know high reward kind of stuff that that Duke hasn't been doing so mostly this year. And between that fast breaking and Derek Lively's dominance, um, and 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 also the other thing I noticed that was different about Duke was that Jeremy Roach was the go to guy more than Kyle Filipowski. We've mostly seen Flip as the go to guy lately. It feels like this might be a, a slightly new Duke, or at least a different Duke from what we've seen earlier in the year. And the other thing that I thought was different was that we we finally won a close game down the stretch. This Duke team has struggled to score down the stretch repeatedly again and again and again. On this game, it was UNC that didn't score at all in the final three and a half minutes, not Duke. And that was because of Jeremy Roach in the final five and a half minutes of the game with the game tied at 53. Jeremy Roach scored eight points. The only other points that Duke scored were the two points that Derek Lively scored that I think might, might, might have actually been a pass by Jeremy Roach because he tossed that so high off the backboard and Lively was the only guy on the other side. I, that was weird. That was weird. That that just happened, right? Yeah. I wonder if, oh, you know what? Hold on. My mic was sitting on my mouse pad. Oh, that might be why the recording stopped there. I really wonder if perhaps the bucket that Lively scored that put back was was Jeremy Roach intentionally throwing it to him off the top of the backboard. It it, it kind of looked like it could have been. Jason, we had 20 fast break points of the night. UNC only had two. And when we talked about the free throws, the fact that we actually went to the line a lot, a lot of that was on the fast break but we finished through contact and then had an and one opportunity we, we didn't make all of them but we had got those opportunities by it seemed like unc thought we were going to be the team that we've been we've been all season and kind of said oh we'll get the rebound we'll get across half court and then set up our offense and we just weren't doing that like you know jeremy roach tyrese proctor were leading with a, a mission and they were saying hey we're going to go straight to the rim and everybody follow me let's go and the fact is you had him, you had Mark Mitchell, who I thought was great on the break. He had a couple of those where he laid it in. Derek Lively had the putbacks. Kyle Filipowski had a couple of and one opportunities. Tyrus Proctor had a couple of and one opportunities. Everyone felt like when they got the ball, it, everyone was going, everyone in Duke was going downhill. And it, it, it was refreshing because we talked about this in the preseason, that this was going to be a Duke team that we thought could run out a little bit more. We see that they can do that very successful in the, in one of the biggest games that they'll have all year. And in a game where, you know, Carolina doesn't expect to be giving up so many defensive rebounds, you know, Carolina only only pulls down about 30 percent of its offensive rebounding chances last night. And that is what helps lead, you know, going back to talking about the bigs as we were before uh, that that gives a ton of room for. Uh, for Duke to be creating the fast break because it's not like the 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 half court sets last night were working great for Duke. I think they were fine, but but Duke's Duke is still struggling a bit in the half court to to execute all those fast breaks. You know, Proctor getting seven defensive rebounds. That's what you know. In a way, that's the difference last night uh, with with Duke able to execute so well quickly and get those points. Yeah, we we win the rebounding battle forty six to forty. And, and a Carolina team that doesn't give up a lot of offensive rebounds. And Duke did not get a lot of offensive rebounds in the first half. The fact that we got him in the second half was was super, super important. And then the last thing I want to mention about those guards, you were talking about them. I, I feel like I said it earlier, but I want to reiterate the quality of the defense that Roach and Proctor played on Love and Davis. R.J. Davis and Caleb Love are capable of being as dangerous as any backcourt in the country. And and I, I just repeatedly saw Roach and Proctor fighting hard through screens, playing smart, staying in front of those guys. H how many times did did Davis and Love, you know, get into the lane against Duke? Very, very rarely. Yeah, part of that was that they didn't want to go up against, you know, Derek Lively. But part of that was also 
Roach and Proctor staying in front of them phenomenally well. I want to talk about one other guy on on Duke yesterday who had uh, a, a standout game, although in fewer minutes, and that was Jacob Grandison. Came in and and played safety valve very well for Duke. Had two huge baskets. One a a three pointer uh, that looked totally in rhythm, and the other was an impressive and one uh, that that he executed with him uh, landing on the floor, which I really loved. So you know, we I don't think Grandison has quite lived up to the season. Hasn't quite lived up to the the expectations that we had for him coming in as a grad student transfer who had been a really productive guy on an on an Illinois team for a few years but but he he was enough for that last night and in a game where John Shire has continued to shorten the bench Ryan Young basically isn't in the rotation last night maybe because Lively is having such a good game and and refuses to commit the fouls that force him to go to the bench but uh, Young only gets six minutes. Jalen Blakes gets two. Grandison's the only guy that gets double digit minutes coming off Yo. the bench for Duke last night. Yeah, wait, 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 really quick. I know Donald wants to get in, but did you guys see the plus minus on Lively and Young? No. Derek Lively, Derek Lively was plus fourteen. Ryan Young was minus eight in those six minutes. I think that this was a you know it, not to knock Ryan Young. This is just a terrible matchup for him because Armando Baycott is kind of similar to Ryan Young. Like they both play sort of similar games. Yeah, they they play similar Below the kind rim. Of games. But Baycott's just a little more athletic. And so it was just, it's a really, that's a really bad matchup for Ryan Young, as we can tell by minus eight in six minutes. I think that's why Derek Lively played 34 minutes. Yeah. And also, I, I think it was just a testament to how good Derek Lively played. I didn't think Ryan Young played especially terrible. Um, but like you said, Jason, I just think the matchup wasn't there. Jacob Granison, I thought was great um, it, in his time off the bench. And honestly, like, think about it. Like, all these guys, these these veterans that we had coming off the bench, Jalen Blakes and Jeremy Roach are really the two guys that played last night that have any experience in a Duke UNC game. So like that, or at least experiencing what it was like to be a part of that festivity and part of the, the atmosphere and the hoopla and all of that. So, you know, those guys were probably like, hey, I didn't under, weren't ready for the for the challenge in, in that sense. But I thought they answered the bell, right? Like they 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 fought out there and I didn't think Ryan Young had a terrible game. It was just that, you know, when he was in the game, Armando Baycott was just slightly more athletic than him. And with Derek Lively playing as well as he was playing, it made sense to go with Lively the rest of the way. Guys, we're going to take a quick break. When we get back, we'll go through the bad from this game. I think there's still stuff that, that Duke is trying to work out as they're in the midst of what we had told you a week ago was going to be, you know, the the crucial tough stretch of the season. There, We, we said that this was a, a four-game set. Uh, Duke is now 2-0 and through it. They've got Miami with a quick turnaround on Monday and then Virginia next weekend. So we'll come back from the break. We'll talk about the bad. And then we'll also give you a very quick preview of the Miami game that's coming up. We don't have to say too much about it because Duke played Miami, oh, about two weeks ago. So uh, they have they have plenty of, of recent tape to go off of. But you wonder if Miami is watching the tape from last night and thinking, oh, boy, Derek Lively is a different cat now. All of that after the break. We are back and we are going to start with the bad from the Duke UNC game. Uh, hopefully not too much to highlight here, but Donald, can you can you start us off with with the bad from this game? Yeah, I think the only thing to, to kind of, you know, work on is the fact that UNC, despite the fact that they didn't make a lot of shots, they did have a lot of open looks. And there was a couple of times where I thought the defense was great, but they did break down in the sense that, you know, Leaky Black had a couple of, you know, open threes from the corner. Notably, that one with under a minute left that he ended eventually missed, but he had a couple in the corner that he did hit. Um, there was just, you know, a few of those where guys were rotating or just, you know, missed an assignment or missed the communication and it ended up with an open, you know, uncontested shot for UNC, both inside the paint and outside the paint. So those are things I think we need to work on. Um, you know, the the defensive talk was there. And obviously in a rivalry game is a little harder to hear, even when you're in the friendly confines of Cameron. But it's one of those things where, you know, a, a good team that can sh is shooting the ball well on the night, some of those miscues can hurt you uh, down the stretch. And the fact that this was a six-point game, there were a few of those looks, if they go the other way, we may be talking about a different result this morning. 
And you you might be able to get away with that against a Carolina team that takes a lot of threes but is not great at hitting them. Uh, don't do that against Virginia because right. Virginia will make shots where where Carolina does not. And and I know Duke is not entirely looking ahead at Miami, but it's something that or at, at Virginia they're they're looking at at Miami, but something to keep in mind. Jason, did you have a bad from this game that you wanted to highlight? Yeah, I I hate to do this to the guy Mark Mitchell. I think. Uh, other than he had a little flurry in the second half, like around the 15 minute mark or so where he scored a couple buckets. But other than that, Mark Mitchell's kind of completely absent on offense. Uh, it, it feels like everybody else gets involved other than, than him. I mean, he, he got some rebounds. He played good help defense. There's no question about that. I'm not saying that Mark Mitchell isn't useful to this team, but, but it, it, it feels lately like he has really become an afterthought on the offensive end of the floor. And, you know, this kind of dovetails a little bit on what Sam was saying a couple minutes ago. I'm starting to feel like maybe this Duke team is a little bit better with Jacob Grandison on the floor than Mark Mitchell. I I don't know if I want to quite go there yet, but, but there's certainly an argument that, that Grandison's ability to provide more spacing and make, you know, more experienced, smarter plays might be of slightly more use than Mark Mitchell. Uh, You know, I think the challenge, Jason, for Mitchell that I saw last night is that if he has the ball with space, he almost gets too excited. And he doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily like when he's driving to the basket, have his head up like he's not he's not he's not looking around. He's like working really hard to like get there and then doesn't really have a plan. Once he gets there, there were a couple drives where where he sort of missed the layup or he just like drove through traffic and then exited again because he because he clearly didn't have a plan and and UNC you know has all the size in the middle that prevents you from just getting away with with uh you know with that kind of of offensive execution i hope that especially if if whitehead is still out and it it sounded like it was a relatively game time decision like they only decided the morning of or the day before the game yesterday that Whitehead wasn't going to play. Hopefully Whitehead is coming back soon, which means that, you know, Mitchell probably ends up on the bench because of that. If Whitehead is healthy and and is able to play big minutes, he's the starter. We don't know when that's going to happen. And at least for now, John Shire has to assume that Mitchell keeps getting minutes because if he doesn't trust some of the other guys on the bench, and if Grandison, frankly, can't carry the load on defense that Mitchell can then you have to just recognize what what Mitchell's limitations are. And hopefully with Proctor continuing to be comfortable with the ball handling, with Jeremy Roach being back from injury and, and comfortable with the ball handling, you don't want Mark Mitchell dribbling as much as he did last night. So it might just be a matter of tweaking the the offensive game plan, especially in the half court, which is really where I think Mitchell gets himself like <laughs> too too excited and too overwhelmed. Uh, hopefully, hopefully that sorts itself out in the next few weeks. Yeah. And look, I, I don't want to get into a discussion about who should go pro or, or NBA stuff like that. <laughs> I, I, I know I've heard from various sources that Mark Mitchell's thinking about it. I, I feel like he's the kind of guy that if he came back and got a little more experienced, and was able to work on, oh, these are the things I succeed at, and these are the things that don't work for me, that he could really turn into a tremendously effective offensive player in college basketball, but he's just not that right now. And then the other thing I had in the bad, I, I we haven't mentioned Kyle Filipowski's name very much in this game, and I, I don't want to imply that he was awful. He, he wasn't by any stretch of the imagination, but he was just 4 of 14 from the field. He did force things at time. Um, it seems a little bit crazy that uh, a 14 and seven game, he had 14 points and seven rebounds would be a subpar game. Most players, 14 and seven would be a monster game. But Kyle has been so good for the past month. This was his lowest scoring output. Those 14 points, the least number of points he scored since the Florida State game on December 31st. And and it wasn't for a lack of shot attempts that he only scored 14 points. I, the best Duke team, the Duke team that gets back to being the top 10 national title contender that we all thought they were in the preseason is a Duke team where Kyle Filipowski is more efficient than he was last night. So guys, let's do our plays of the game and our players of the week before we, I I, I also had failed to mention that I want to uh, give it back to Donald for a quick recap of what he saw last night at Cameron. And then we need to quickly touch on Miami. So a few things left on the agenda. First, let's do our plays of the game 
from Duke's win against UNC. Jason, I'll let you go first. Yeah, I bet I bet one of you is also going to take this play. Derek Lively's block on Caleb Love with about four minutes left. The play where Kyle Filipowski got hurt, uh, but where he swatted the ball into Mecklenburg County. I mean, like that ball would still be traveling right now if it wasn't for it hitting the the side of Cameron. That was an absurd block shot. And the thing that was important about it was it was Derek Lively saying, not in my house to Caleb Love and telling Caleb Love, you will not be making those highlight reel magic plays against Duke in this game the way you have in the past. I love that play, even though Kyle Filipowski got hurt. Donald, what'd you have? So mine is also a series of Derek Lively blocks. Um, Early in the first half, or I guess middle of the first half, Armando Baycott gets the ball right around the, the like perimeter, the the uh, four foot circle that's right around the basket. He turns around and jumps up, and Derek Lively blocks the shot. He blocks it basically where it's kind of tipped in the air off of the backboard, and Armando Baycott gets it in even better position right underneath the basket, and he goes back up knowing that he's probably going to get fouled and go to the line at the very least. Nah, Derek Lively blocked it again. He blocked Armando Baycott twice in the same possession. That's my favorite play of the game. I had a couple that I really loved. We mentioned already Kyle Filipowski's block on the perimeter, which is one of the hardest things to do is just to lunge at the guy as he's taking the three and to tip the ball straight in the air. He had one of those. Um, Derek Lively had one block against Pete Nance. Well, he had a few blocks against Pete Nance, but he had one uh, where he smashed it against the backboard just to emphasize like you're not you're not coming back in here. My favorite play I'll go with is is Jeremy Roach's layup right at the end of the game to seal it. Uh, I, I love seeing him you know we 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 talked about how he was able to get the angle on that and use the screen appropriately it's great that that Roach is is healthy enough that he's back doing that sort of yo-yo maneuver on on opposing players and and I think it bodes really well as much as the blocks are great for Duke Roach being able to finish is a is a huge key for them here at the end of the season hey I gotta ask you know are we finally are we kind of seeing the Duke theme that we expected in the preseason where Jeremy Roach is, is this, you know, go-to guy score where Derek Lively is controlling the paint and blocking all the shots. I'm, I'm thinking back to our, our, our preseason, you know, episodes where we were talking about what this team would be. And it really has, it hasn't been the team we expected it to be. If, if Derek Whitehead comes back and is actually scoring like in the mid teens then, then we're going to be the team we expected. Wouldn't that be nice, huh? <laughs> yeah, that that's a huge if, though, is is whether Whitehead I, I comes hear you. back I got healthy. You, yeah. So yeah. I act, what, what's amazing is that, you know, Duke has had, they, they were both close victories, but Duke has had two really good wins uh, this past week against Wake and UNC. They haven't done it, I think, with all of the all of the pieces working together. So there's still room, I think, for Duke to get better. You know, their, their resume to this point in the season is something like, you know, four, five, six seed, maybe Duke it at, at full strength. We know is capable of being a national title contender, because if you add the like healthy expectations of Tariq Whitehead to what we saw last night, you have a pretty awesome team. I, I I'm just going to say that this team and any team that we've seen at this point, this season is not like what we predict in the preseason, because admittedly, I don't think anyone thought that Kyle Filipowski was going to be the star that he is, but I will take this version of Duke even more than the preseason aspirations that we had, because if we have everything, Jason, that you just mentioned, we still get to throw in a Kyle Filipowski that's at the top of this game, and that makes us even better, maybe, than we thought uh, if we get everything together in the preseason. And yes, I know that's a big if. Let's pick our players of the week, and uh, I think you've only got a couple choices here, but uh, Jason, give me your player of the week. A couple choices? There's only one choice. It's Derek Lively. I mean, do you do you, do you forget he scored? Uh, I'm sorry, he had four block shots against Wake also. Dude gets 12 block shots in two games. Uh-uh, no, nah, no one else is player of the week. Derek Lively, player of the week. Donald? I'm going with Jeremy Roach. Uh, 41 points this week. He carried the team in several stretches against Wake and UNC. I'm happy with Derek Lively being a pick, but Sam is right. There's two There's two out there, and I think we just selected both of them. I th- th- I was referring to the fact that you could pick Lively or Roach, and I was prepared as the last person to go here with host privileges to take Roach if either of you did not, because I think he deserved it for, 
for his combined effort between these two games. But since he's, you know, getting the highlight of the season here, he at least deserves to win the podcast player of the week award. I'm giving it to Derek Lively, an outstanding performance, maybe something that is going to finally unseat Kyle Filipowski from ACC rookie of the week, which he seems to win like, you know, every, every week. three out of four <laughs> weeks. So uh, hopefully, hopefully Lively picks up that honor this week because what an impressive performance. Eight, blo- eight blocks. I saw That's last amazing. night tweeted the Duke men's basketball said this was the, uh, this is tied for the second most blocks in a game for a Duke freshman. Mike Jaminski has the first and second. Uh, he he had he had nine blocks in a game and eight blocks in a game as a freshman. So uh, and, and Derek the, Lively, the most blocks ever against a UNC team, and, yeah, against UNC, yeah, and, and right, and the most blocks against the UNC team. So so second most blocks ever in a game by a Duke freshman. Most blocks ever against UNC. Uh, that's a that's a pretty awesome highlight for Derek Lively. Before we talk about Miami very quickly, I did want to come back to Donald's because Donald, we didn't get to talk much about you being in the building last night and what you got to experience. So what did you see? What did you hear? Can you hear this morning? And uh, did you see any, did you see any like friends or fans uh, in the arena or, or outside at the, at the bonfire afterwards? Yeah. So first off the, the noise uh, notification, noise little notification on my Apple watch did go off several times during the game last night. So Good job, Cameron. We did we did work in in Apple Watch thinks I'm now deaf, um, but I can hear um, uh, this morning, which is uh, a, a, a remarkable fact given that how loud Cameron was last night. First, let me talk about some of the people that I bumped into uh, that listened to the show. Shout out my boy Max Perkins, class of '04. He literally, Jason Sam. He told me he we ran into each other at halftime, and he said he knew I was going to be at the game, not because of because we know each other and that we try to get to these big moments but because he had stumbled upon a f- podcast for the first time yesterday and did not know that we had this show and that I was on it. And that's how he found out that I was going to the game. So shout out my boy, Max, for A, being a good friend, and B, stumbling upon the podcast on the best time to do it, right around Duke UNC. So hats off to him. I, I told you this after I was at the bonfire last night and I had to sign off, but literally right as I hung up with you guys, I ran into Ryan Fulton, and his daughter, Avery. And if you remember last summer, Avery uh, asked us to do a birthday shout out for her dad because her dad was a big Duke fan and listened to the show. Uh, he found me. He literally heard my voice as I was hanging up with you guys and was right next to me on the quad by the bonfire. So just want to say hi to both of them. Avery, it was her first game in Cameron last night. Ran to so many friends and stuff, but I do want to shout out my best friends, Jeff, Katie, and Ethan, my godson, it was the first time that he got to go to Duke. We got to walk around campus. And uh, for a four-year-old, I'm sure he'll remember bits and pieces of it. But I'm so, so happy that we were finally able to get him to a game, and especially one like last night where we're going to be talking about that for quite a while. So so those were some of the people that were were out there. I'll, I'll leave it to you guys if you have any other comments on that. We'll go back to the atmosphere. No, I, I, my only question was, did you have any other uh, post-game interviews that you conducted? No, no. At that point, <laughs> it was three hours past his bedtime, um, and so we needed to go. So uh, we, we stood around for a few minutes. I ran to my friends, Rosie uh, and, uh, and Nick. Nick runs Duke Peloton, for those of you who are part of that club. Um, and the funny thing was he, he mentioned that the pop in Cameron at the end when, uh, when Jeremy Roach hit the layup, was like an exorcism like everyone just that that whatever nervous tension that was present all that weight was lifted when that ball went through the hoop and we went up four and it felt like at that point it was it was game time um and that we were about to go so uh the atmosphere inside players were all over the place i believe there's about 30 former players that came back the dog was there kenny denard uh he'll be on this podcast hopefully very soon when we get towards episode 500 mason Plumley, mark williams Paul Bancaro and Wendell Carter were both there. They both went into the, the section 17 before the game. Reggie Love, Cherokee Parks was there. JD Simpson was there. Ricky Price was there. The list goes on. There was, I mean, it was it was a star set of the fair. And that's just the former players, not counting those who sit on the bench as the current coaching staff. So that was pretty cool. The fans, I, this was unlike Donald, they they yeah. they showed uh Paulo and Wendell Carter in the stands before the game and yeah uh, 
and Paulo and had like a, a, a blow up sword or something in his hand. It yeah, was, they were yeah. handing they were handing props to him and stuff yeah. like that. But yeah, the uh, my my friend I was watching the game with my my old Duke roommate Jordan, uh, who I'm who I'm <laughs> here with this week. He said, uh, "Man, could you imagine tenting out there for weeks?" And then you get in the stands and all of a sudden Paulo Bancaro is standing in front of you like, man, I really, I really screwed this whole thing up. <laughs> but they had a great time with it. They were there during pregame and eventually went back to uh, their spots behind the Duke bench. But let me talk about the atmosphere, guys. Jason, last year when we went to the game, if you remember, everything outside was just like a circus. It was just a carnival atmosphere. Right? Crazy. It was awesome. Yeah. Crazy. This was different because everyone was inside. We got again, we got to Cameron about an hour before tip off and we thought, hey, we're getting there right when the doors open. We're pretty early. No, everyone was inside. Everyone was ready for this game. Cable was empty. Everything was gone. Uh, but when we walked in for warm ups, everyone was already at a level 57 and then increased from there. Cameron was rocking. It was loud so many times during the game. Unprompted, the entire gymnasium would be on their feet, rising cheering going crazy there was no chance from the camera crazy telling the upstairs to stand up like we've seen in recent years the upstairs was was going as as ham as everyone else uh for several stretches of the game uh the crazies i couldn't make this out unfortunately uh but they had some chance for armando baycott and caleb love that i couldn't make out but it was clear that they were that they were practiced like everyone knew when to do them um and during the warm-ups and at times during the games you could hear it um, I think the loudest cheer was, uh, at least the loudest chant was, uh, I believe, when Caleb Love had an air ball um, on a three pointer. The entire the entire gym let him know for the rest of the game that you sir had an air ball. It was it was really really loud, even during a national anthem. Guys, we've all been there for several games. National anthem is usually one of the few times that Cameron is quiet, except for the person who's singing the national anthem, and that person was a former Duke football player, Lee Rodeo. But everyone in the building, almost everyone in the building, joined in with them. So that just added to that intensity. That just the intensity and the and the energy was present from the moment you stepped foot into Cameron. Everyone had a great time, and you know, even when there was points when UNC was up a little bit or, or looked like they're making a comeback, we always say that's when Duke near, when Cameron needs to be at its loudest point, and it certainly was last night. This team was really willed by the by the energy of everyone that was in that building. Everyone, honestly, watching at home, I saw videos of, of you know, Duke alumni watch parties in D.C. and New York and San Francisco, all over the place where people were going nuts. This, it felt like everyone was ready for this one. So congrats to everyone who was watching the game, who was at the game especially. I think all of that energy contributed to Duke pulling this out at the end. So uh, there's a little story about fans getting in trouble that I just wanted to share with you guys super quick. And, and and this should be a lesson for Duke fans to be smart about what they cheer and what they say. Colorado State was playing Utah State. Uh, Utah State has a guard, um, Max uh, Shulga is his name, who is from Kiev, Ukraine. And he stepped to the free throw line and the Colorado State fans started chanting, Russia, Russia, at the Ukrainian guy. Oh, yeah, that's not good. There's a bad that's look. That's, that's oh, not, no. Yeah. You can't do that. Yeah. Um, so. Colorado State has issued an apology. They are really, really sorry that they did that. So the my my warning to Duke fans is at Cameron, let's be smart. <laughs> let's be smart and let's not make national headlines by doing something stupid when we cheer. So Jason, to that end, there was a couple of things I wanted to point out. I think right in the in the first half, there was a point where uh Roger Ayer stopped play because they had to remove uh one of the Cameron crazies and they kind of went to a TV timeout after that. Um, at first, we thought, oh, this guy's being ejected, but apparently he had passed out. Um, he's fine, um, but they had to, they stopped it so that they could get the personnel in there to kind of escort him out um, of the section, which which is warranted. But at the same time, it was it was not explained inside what was going on. I think they, we learned through the grapevine what had happened. The only, I guess the only negative I would point out was that there was a couple of instances where some items were thrown onto the court. Um, and I think it, it was, just people going, you know, being energetic and being kids, but it wasn't to during the course of play. It was during the half times or during the uh, breaks in uh, in action. Uh, but guys, let's not do that. Let's keep everything in the stands. But uh, I mean, other than that, guys, it was vintage Cameron um, jet engine noise. Like, as I mentioned, ear splitting pops like, you know, WWE, they, they talk about the crowd pops. There were several of those during the game. And whenever Duke was 
about to take the lead, it, again, unprompted, the entire gym was on its feet and going nuts and trying to get us across that finish line. So locked in the whole way. That's what Cameron should be every game. And especially for Duke UNC, it was a it was a fitting, fitting way uh, to be there for a game is to be a part of the action and not just watch the action. All right, guys, we've we've gone on long enough. I, I want to very quickly get each of your keys to the game. Duke is uh, has a quick turnaround here. They play at Miami uh, tomorrow night. We're recording Sunday morning. They're playing Monday night in Coral Gables. I will be in attendance, so I'm excited for that, uh, hoping to make it to the uh, alumni pregame event. And uh, so hopefully we I, I see some, some Duke fans there. I'll be uh, in the media section for that game tomorrow. So hopefully Duke is able to uh, continue its its little winning streak against Miami. It was a tight one, if you'll recall, a couple weeks ago at Cameron. This one should be harder because it's it's on the road, and you know it's not like it's not like Miami is the toughest ACC road environment, but it is one. So uh, let me get your keys to the game. And Donald, I want to start with you because I know that you know you you follow Miami more closely. Uh, what is it that that Duke needs to either take into this game or, or change from the last time to be uh, to be important for their victory, hopeful victory against the Hurricanes? I, I just because it's Miami doesn't change my answer. Um, it's Pedialyte. We got to take as many as much Pedialyte as possible to avoid the hangover after beating UNC. Um, that's always what happens. We always have this, you know, unless it's the last game of the season, we always have this point where we have UNC, and then a couple days later we find someone else and that someone else is waiting for us because they know that we are on an energetic high after beating UNC, uh, you know, wherever. We need to avoid that. And we need to come out with the same intensity and physicality and, and energy that we showed last night. That's going to be the key to this game. If we, it, it will be very apparent to me five minutes into the game if we are ready to play this game because Miami is definitely going to be ready. We need to match that intensity very early on. Otherwise, it's going to be a long night. And – it remains to be seen if Derek Whitehead is playing. And I, I also hope Donald, to your point that the fact that Duke has already played Miami this year helps a little bit because it's not like they need to start from zero today in the game prep. Jason, what did you have for uh, the key to the, to the quick turnaround Miami game on Monday? I, I think it's going to be very important. The fact that Miami is a team that counts on shot makers on the perimeter and they are not a team it tends to bang the ball into the post the way Carolina does. We're all thrilled and excited. And we just spent, you know, 45 plus minutes talking about how great Derek Lively was. I it, and and he can continue to be great. He he needs to protect the rim and protect the paint for Duke in this game. But uh, if we win this game, it's going to be because we figure out a way to stop Isaiah Wong and Nigel Pack on the perimeter, not that we figure out a way to stop Miami's big men. Miami has not lost a game at home all year. Since Duke beat them a couple weeks ago, they've been playing really well. Like they they took that loss and they're like, no, we're not going to let that get us down. I mean, they just they just won at Clemson. Not easy to do. They blew out Florida State a couple weeks ago. They beat Virginia Tech by nine. Look, Duke fans know Virginia Tech is no slouch. This Miami team has been playing like a top 20 club for the past few weeks. Uh, and they are an absolutely elite, elite, elite offensive team. We, we you know, th this is a really tough tough matchup for duke i think and like donald said i worry tremendously about the hangover you know that not not just that we celebrate it but just that you know we put so much focus into carolina turning around going on the road to a team that hasn't lost at home all year this is a really really tough one but it's super important because the acc is so bunched at the top there are three teams in the ACC with three losses at the top of the conference. And then there are three teams with four losses right behind them. And Duke and Miami are both in that group with four losses. The loser of this game goes to five and the road to winning the conference. If you lose this game is a lot, lot, lot harder. If you win this game, you're in a really good spot though. And you know, it's, it's massive. And I hope the team's able to get their focus for it. The one thing that uh, we did great last time against Miami, Miami is one of the most efficient teams in the country on offense and we really like locked them down in the sense where they didn't shoot the ball well. If we can do that, if our defense shows up again, that energy needs to be there. If Derek Lively, I don't need him to do eight blocks, right? That that'd be that'd be fun again. But he doesn't have to do that to beat Miami. If he can come with the same energy that he brought last night, then we will have a much better time out. And I think again, 
their efficiency is what helps lead Miami. And if they can be, if we can help them be inefficient on offense, we're going to have a good shot in this game. Bit bigger than the eight blocks to me was Lively had 14 rebounds. He's mm-hmm. been blocking shots all year. The rebounds are a new thing for him. And that's something that would be really effective against Miami. Miami does have a big man who, who grabs a ton of rebounds and, and, and that's going to be a big key for Duke, not letting them have second chance points and getting our own second chance points. Jason, you mentioned the three-point shooting. I'm just going to highlight these numbers again from Duke's first meeting with Miami. Miami's three starters who actually take the threes, Pack Wong and Miller, uh, went nine for 16 against Duke from three in the first game. Uh, they were all basically abysmal from from two. So there is a, it's a totally different type of, of defensive effort here where – you know, Carolina also takes a lot of threes. They just don't make them the way that Miami does. Carolina has the safety valve of being able to go inside. Miami doesn't doesn't have that as much. They they don't produce points in the paint the way that Carolina does. So it's a very different defensive type of game. I don't think that Derek Lively is going to have a chance to block eight shots in this one uh, unless Duke is, is just getting all the way into Miami shorts uh, on the perimeter. So a very different game that, that Duke has to prepare for. We'll see, as I said, if Derek Whitehead is playing in this one. But um, we'll be back, I'm sure, after the game to to recap that, if not uh, to do more bites in between. So for Jason Evans and for Donald Wine, I'm Sam Klein. Stay in touch with us, DDRpodcast at gmail.com. And once again, Carolina, go to hell. We'll talk to you again soon. Duke Band, take us home. It was funny uh, last night. I was wearing, uh, you know, the dog has that GTHC, GTH stuff. So I was wearing my beanie uh, yeah. in the car. And he, when I go over to the house to, to meet with them, he was like, oh, so you were that. So your shirt says Duke and my shirt says Duke. I go, yep. They both say Duke. And he goes, your hat says go to home, Carolina. I go, yes, go to home. <laughs> That's go to home, Carolina. So he was, he was saying that at points of the game. He was like, what do we do in Carolina? They go to home. <laughs> How old is he? He's four. <laughs> go to go home, home is perfect. We'll learn the good stuff later. So. <laughs>